I'm here today with Maury Gingrich, uh, a Republican representing the 101st District in Lebanon County from 2003 to 2016. Thank you for being with me today. Happy to be here. Great. I'm going to start um, by asking you some questions about your background and then we'll move on to some time about your uh, work here in the house. All right. Can you describe your childhood and family life? Oh my goodness. That's probably going to be the most enjoyable part of our interview. Uh, I'm the eldest of 10 children. I know it's always a Big. shock to folks. So <laughs> I've actually been a leader from the time I was 18 months old and the next sibling was born and right down the line. So I had leadership responsibilities. Might have something to do with my life choices afterwards. Uh, raised in a, a, an extremely um, healthy family environment. I feel blessed by that. My dad, he taught at the State Police Academy. My mother, obviously with 10 children, you can imagine, stayed home and ran a very uh, structured and, and loving household. So. Uh, early on, we um, knew responsibility. You know, we were taught that in our family life and a very strong Christian background as well. So um, my family life was great. Um, again, we were always encouraged to do for the community, get involved in the community. And I think often uh, if children are brought up in an environment of support like that and that type of encouragement of getting out there and doing something, that probably does have a lot to do with the decisions that you make later in life. And fairly sure that it did in mine. Good. Um, can you talk a little about where you went to school, your educational background? My parents chose um, Catholic parochial school for all 10 of us, wow. which had to be a bit of a struggle for them when I think of the commitment that it took on their part. So I had the privilege of, although parochial schools at that time uh, were not as expensive, obviously, um, and maybe more affordable for more people. Uh, but the numbers were much greater in the classroom where people I know you were fortunate to go to a smaller parochial school. Not so much. There were 90-some uh, students in my first grade class at St. Joan of Arc School. One in the one classroom. Uh, you know, they didn't one have a in two or three. One nun, not oh. a teacher. <laughs> But a nun, <laughs> fully equipped. And I will never forget the construction of the room with the one, the one desk up front against the, the nun teacher's desk. And that was always a kid causing trouble that day. And the rest were all in semicircles around the room. And she literally fit us all in there. Uh, what's interesting is that I've kept in touch with a lot of those kids. And this is grade school uh, over a lifetime. And they are all incredibly successful coming out of a classroom with 98 kids. So uh, I appreciate that part from my educational background with my parents. They also chose to send us to a, a Catholic and parochial high school. Uh, and there, the classes weren't quite as large because you're structured differently in high school. Uh, but I found that to be very, very beneficial. Now, at the time that I went to a, a high school and you met with your guidance counselor, they directed young women in a more limited area of choices. And so often, they were either teaching social work or medicine. And um, I, I can't recall, and I, believe it or not, I was a pretty good student uh, with pretty good grades that you think they'd say, well, maybe you want to be a lawyer. Maybe you'd rather be a doctor, you know, than a nurse or, or some other service in healthcare. Uh, but those were kind of the categories that you talked about. So I chose medicine, so I went in that direction. So my background and degree is in medical technology. Uh, never sorry for that because it gave me an opportunity to be entrenched in healthcare early on. When I came to the level of responsibilities I've had in the past years, healthcare has been almost one of our number one issues from the beginning. Not only that, but healthcare took me into uh, the um, aging care realm. I was a director of marketing because I went into the business side of medicine early on, and I worked for a very large uh, retirement community that was independent living through skilled care. So, uh, you know, I was able to experience a lot of what was going on in healthcare, the escalating number of seniors, the, our population here in Pennsylvania, and how ill-prepared we were as a state, even as communities, and then certainly as, as a state level. So while I look back and I think, I wonder why more opportunities weren't like given to me and encouraged for me, I'm completely happy that I, that I traveled the path that I did that got me here eventually. Very, very, very unique path here. Um, you already described your career a little bit before coming to the House. Um, so what made you shift to, to set, pursue public service? What I did not mention to you uh, along that career path was that community, civics, and government was always a priority in my life. 
um, combined, compiled tightly with my career path. Um, and I do need to mention I had four children in the meantime. <laughs> so, um, you know, they became um, kind of my driving force for the structure that I chose for my life span, um, both in the community and, and professionally. So I always did both. When I was a student in school, civic, student government, all those things were my interests. They were my passion. So I was always involved in that during the educational process. Uh, when I finished college, began working and, and had children fairly early. As soon as I got out of college, we, I married and we began having our children, which is the reverse now of my own children. <laughs> but that's the way we did it. So the community became even more key to me raising children. I wanted a healthy community in which to raise my children. So uh, very early on, I was involved in the PTO, the church board, the library board, all of those uh, areas in the community that build a network, by the way. I'm laying the groundwork for how did I get where I am. So you're building a network and you're not doing it because of that. You're not even thinking of that. You're doing it because you're a public servant spirit and you want a healthy community for your family and your economy, correct? So I did that uh, for years, became very involved in situations within the school uh, with uh, students, I don't, I don't know how to put this gracefully, but as, as drug use, minimal and great, started to come into communities, even in our own community in, in Lebanon County, uh, I decided to get more involved in that so that when my kids reach that age, we'd have at least a good plan in place for how to deal with that. Therefore, I became very close to the chief of police and the mayor in the community in which I lived so that we could structure a um, plan for kids who found themselves, you know, wandering off potentially uh, in the wrong way early. And what, I'm not so glad I did that, but what I saw there was the mayor and the police were not necessarily agreeing on all, uh, the mayor was hardcore, kid messes up, kid gets arrested, kid has a record, right? Police chief was the opposite. No, let's work with these young people. Let's get them on the right course. Let's invest in them up front. It became like an internal battle in the little community. So you can guess who started going to borough council meetings. You know, it was mother of four, you know, Mari Gingrich. Um, always respectfully signed in on the agenda. Um, ask very legitimate questions about how we were proceeding with some of this stuff. Um, eventually, the police chief was so frustrated that he moved back to the western part of PA, which where he was from. And I honestly think him leaving motivated me to be even more active on the governmental level. Now that mayor was an older gentleman, committed many years of his life, was doing you know, a great job in every way that he could. He was from a different generation. Um, and, and he, um, God bless him, finally passed away and, and a new mayor came in. And the council um, knew me from coming to the meetings and asking legitimate questions. So when another older council person passed away, because in local government, many people stay for years for many reasons. Number one, um, you know, they're, they're not confident. They don't see people who are interested in running. Uh, people have personal agendas, so they stay. They stay forever sometimes. Uh, and, in, and I admire them for their commitment. But this gentleman was an elderly man and, and, and he succumbed. Uh, seat was empty. Now the borough council has 30 days to fill the vacancy. And they're like, oh my goodness, who do we know that we could encourage to look at this seat for the next 18 months to fill that gentleman's uh, seat and term? And a few people came up to me and said, is this something you'd ever be interested in? And I said, I've never thought about it in my life, but I will now. So we went home, had a family concave with all these little munchkins of mine sitting at my feet, my husband, and I'm saying, how do we feel about me taking on this responsibility? I am working full time as director of marketing. We have four little kids that are involved in everything there is to be involved in. My husband said to me, I can't think of anyone I'd rather have make my tax decisions than you. And local taxes are a big deal, right? Mm -hmm. So eh, everybody agreed, that, but my one son said, what is this going to mean to me personally? Because he meant, will you be at my soccer games? Will you be at my baseball games, basketball, and so on? We made a pact, my husband and I, and I don't think we ever missed a game, one or the other, not both of us, but one or the other always went. That's how I got involved in government. So, you know, I led a family of 
nine siblings when I was young, learned a little bit about setting a model and, you know, um, encouraging them, which I think is meaningful, you know. Got married, went into the medical field, got married and had children and knew the community was going to be very important to me. Something happened in the community that was directly related to government and it opened my eyes to the opportunity there. Um, and I always tell women especially, when the doors open a crack, open it. Go in and see where you can play a role and be effective and have it be a good fit for you and the community. Doesn't work, you can always go back out the door. So many times women don't have the confidence to do that. Or I, I, I think it's a little bit of lack of confidence and, and a little bit of fear of the unknown, especially if you're raising children at the same time, busy you know, with your career path. It can be a challenge, but it's cer certainly a worthy one. So serving in local government was my training ground. And uh, in that, I worked closely with county. I worked closely with my predecessor, the gentleman who was in the 101st seat before I was, um, gave me an outside view, but with a little more knowledge probably than the average person. When uh, that member decided to retire, the community again is coming together, whether it's the chamber or the, you know, the uh, uh, community services and so on. Who can we have represent us? you know, in Harrisburg. Uh, and the business community came to me, the healthcare community came to me from different ways and said, is this something you've ever talked to or thought about? I said, no, but I will now. <laughs> so uh, it was an empty seat in the House of Representatives. Um, n you know, women generally, from what I've seen, don't jump into that opportunity. They will say, well, I probably should have more experience. I probably should take another course. I probably should do this, do that. Uh, and uh, I didn't feel that way. I felt that I had a great role model before me uh, and he had confidence in me and what I had done in the community level and county level that um, it took some time and a, a lot more family meetings <laughs> before we could come you know, to enlightenment and realize that I could bring my experience in healthcare, I could bring my experience in all kinds of community leadership just to another level up here. And I've had 14 years that uh, we've worked very hard and I've worked shoulder to shoulder, literally, with my constituents and uh, we've gotten a lot done. Yes, you have. Um, so, what was your experience during your very first campaign for the House? It's well, campaigning, that's a different different side of Absolutely. being a legislator, being a candidate. Uh, and you can ask uh, the two recent candidates in our, you know, our national level and any national level. It's the same thing with just a few more zeros behind those voters <laughs> and a few more zeros behind the dollars that you, you need to raise. So in my first uh, election, it was an open seat, as I mentioned. There were five candidates in, in that race. Uh, and two of them, well, actually, one of them had run twice before mm -hmm. and lost. So I wasn't sure whether that was a good or a bad thing. The name recognition was there, but he was seen as somebody who lost twice. So uh, that was an element. And then two of the other ones had positive name recognition, one more than another. And he would have made a, he would have made a great legislator as well. Uh, and uh, I considered him a really viable candidate. The other gentleman, uh, had been very, very active in uh, the fire department and other community endeavors. So I thought, well, a lot of people know him, and again, doing good things. The other candidate was another female who um, interestingly came into the race late, um, and um, there are interesting dynamics to politics. And there are those uh, more closely related to that decision that tell me it was an interesting strategy to throw another woman in in the campaign who was from my end of the county. Uh, I thought, okay, harsh reality. Now I realize that, you know, there's going to be strategy used that might be a stumbling block. Uh, did not prove to be because, uh, you know, uh, God bless her, she was an unknown and, and uh, that strategy didn't work. Um, so it was quite an interesting campaign. A, uh, very uh, very genteel 
race compared to what we're seeing today. So, you know, I'm not complaining about that. The challenges were raising money to get your message out. Uh, I did not have a problem um, gathering people in support. I had the old-fashioned kitchen cabinet, some from business, some from healthcare, some from community, college students, um, interested family members. And I mean, and not when I say kitchen cabinet, I mean around my kitchen table. Uh, the fundraising that we did was not uh, these, uh, you know, this huge, expensive mailing uh, processes or going to big corporations. It was very much grass, grassroots, to the point where some of my donations were, and I'll never forget these, came in $5 bills in envelopes from seniors living in senior high-rise buildings that said, I just want to be part of your campaign. And that's all they had was five dollars but yeah you multiply your five dollars and a few five thousand here and there we were able to cobble through uh, and I can say at that time and again this was 15 years over 15 years ago when we ran that campaign uh, in Lebanon County in the 101st district I raised and spent forty thousand dollars now I'm not sure what it's like now, maybe four times that much, and you get to other areas of the state. But in order to get your message out, whether it's mailings or any, you know, any other advertising or message, you know, print message, it, it, it's costly. So we did what we needed to do uh, to have people get our message, but most of it was me out on the streets and my people out knocking on doors, doing what we call macadam campaigning. Uh, I made sure that I, you know, went to breakfast some, uh, somewhere, you know, throughout the county uh, almost every day. Uh, I always was part of so many of our um, community organizations that, that that was just a given. I was, you know, I was there. So I, I think for me, my network in community service built into um, business and industry was a big help to me. So. I won that race with a resounding 64 votes, I think, or 84 votes, something like that. Uh, that never happened again. <laughs> so in the successive times that I ran following that, um, you know, you work hard and you work with people and you show them you're, you're here to get things done for them. It was, it was a plus. I always had an opponent over the years. And uh, sometimes I was always running as a Republican. Sometimes I'd have someone running the Democratic ticket, sometimes independent, sometimes green, you know, third party. So I always felt that every election uh, was just as important as the first one and the one, you know, after that. So we used the same strategy, you know, just constantly being with the people as much as we can. Can't make good decisions in Harrisburg if you don't know what is needed in the community that you represent and the many thousand, sixty some thousand people you vote for every time you lift that finger. So do you enjoy that process? Do you enjoy getting out and I do. talking to constituents? I do. That's, uh, that's uh, natural to me. Uh, so I, I see people feeling plagued by it sometimes. <laughs> That's not the schedule can be tiring. I, I do have a lot of energy. I thank the good Lord, and that's probably why I'm retiring. I don't want to wear out here because I still have a lot of things I want to do. Uh, but uh, I love that part of it, and I truly feel that I would not have made the successful legislation up here without the input and um, the support all along, and the encouragement from the people that sent me here. It's a grueling process here. I have one bill that s hasn't been passed, and I think I've, inter and it's a senior care bill, which is critical. Had letters from the attorney general, from the auditor general related to care and long-term skilled care um, facilities, all just encouraging this Vote, and it always get it's all the way through the Senate. It's ready to be voted on. Sessions over. Didn't get voted on again, and that probably might be one of the in my mind and soul maybe one of the most important things uh, we could have done. But for every one of those bills that that I have pending that we know are good bills, I've had legislators come to me and ask if they can pick up the reins on that. I will turn it all over to them. There's going to be at least three or four bills that still need to be done on top of my 17, whatever we've done. So I'm looking forward to supporting on the outside for a while. 
Did your family assist in your campaigns? You have. Oh my, yeah. <laughs> Quite oh a big support group there. You know there. what's interesting though? <laughs> what is interesting is I only, of, of that large family, I had only one sibling that actually lived in my district that could vote for me. The rest of them just wore their shoes out for me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did have a lot of help from, but I had a tremendous amount of help from all levels of community and business and so on. I value that. Um, do you have any like specific memorable moments on the campaign trail? On the campaign trail? Uh, well, uh, what you remember most is um, how much you walk and how much your feet hurt. I love shoes. I like <laughs> nice shoes. Well, they don't work on the campaign trail. So, I, the, I, it's funny when I think back of uh, my gear, my campaign gear. So, I kept a basket in the back of my car with at least three or four different pairs of shoes. And I'd get through X number of houses or streets or blocks, run back to my car, change my shoes because my feet were hurting so bad. Of course, I have my bag with, with all my materials and so on. It's, it's funny, you feel like a male person when you're <laughs> walking, walking the streets. Um, yeah, the surprises in the campaigning, I was actually a little prepared for that because I had helped with my predecessor's campaign, so that was not new to me. And of course, I had already served in office locally. Um, the surprising things in a campaign are the things people will say and do, either to you or about you. And I can remember walking up to a house on door-to-door -door routine of my own, and they had a mail slot, so their mail was sticking out. They weren't home, but their mail was sticking out. And I'm ringing the doorbell, and I'm just looking, and I have to look down at their, and there's a picture of me with fire coming out of <laughs> my head, like my, my whole head's on fire, and I have dollar bills flying around my head, and I'm burning them. And it said, you know, Gingrich, uh, you know, thinks she, she can take your dollars to burn. And it was a reference to uh, service in the borough council and a tax increase mm -hmm. that we were forced to do, of course, the money has to come in before it can go out. So it was obviously a legitimate local government decision, but they used that to, so, and, and, and that shocked me. And I'm thinking, why are you so surprised? <laughs> but that was not my mode of campaigning at all. So uh, you, you can be surprised along, along the way. Um, mine were mostly positive. The other thing, aside from uh, the feet hurting and making sure you had good shoes, because I didn't quit no matter what, was how many people have dogs? <laughs> you knock on a door and you're greeted by a dog at your shoulders licking your face, <laughs> you hope. You hope they're licking your face. <laughs> so I learned early on in the campaign trail how to talk to dogs. <laughs> so uh, yeah, you have, you have uh, little memories of fun stuff and then some of the harsh reality uh, and then wondering how you were gonna pay the next printing bill. <laughs> You know, and that's when another five dollars would come or something. It was just, uh, you know, I, I think the Lord, the Lord does work in mysterious ways, and He does care about campaigns sometimes. Moving on to coming here to Harrisburg, do you yeah. have any memorable swearing ins? Your first, maybe? Each one is so exciting to me. Swearing in is so exciting, um, and it's not just because the the chamber is gorgeous, just gorgeous, and then that day it's full of flowers. So you've got this fabulous chamber. Um, that particular day, for me at least, you think so much about the people who came before you. You know, you think of all the people, when you raise your hand and you think of Benjamin Franklin doing the same thing, Davy Crockett doing the, you know, you, you think of all those folks that served in the very same capacity that you're being sworn in to serve. Uh, it's, it's humbling and it's sobering. You realize how, you know, you, you come off this, especially the first time, you come off this raucous campaign, because I'm sure everyone's first campaign is raucous. Um, and, you know, it's uh, moment to moment changes. It's, it's radical. Everything about it is radical. And now you've, you've won and you've celebrated and you've brought your people together. You just, the night you win is just ecstasy. Uh, and, and then you get ready to put on your Sunday finest and come in here to begin the job, you know, and be sworn in. And that's when it hits you. Wow. Yeah. 
look what we did to get here, <laughs> you know? And the people that did before. So, uh, but you know, the first one was overwhelming, almost like an out of body experience. Uh, but every one after that, all six after that, uh, have been the same with a you know, proud family uh, there with you. Um, by the time you've, you're sworn in a second time, you are uh, much more comfortable. You know people, you're comfortable there. You've done things with people, you've served on committees, uh, and you, you really feel a part of it. And you're standing there thinking about these new kids on the block. And of course, one of the first things I do is make sure I welcome every new person. Um, and with the women, I make myself available immediately. It's not always easy um, being a woman in the number, the ratio that we have to men here. So uh, I always, in fact, I usually organize a luncheon that I take them to gather the women in one spot and we kind of lay it out in the beginning and then I say just if you don't know what to do call me <laughs> you know? and uh, so we have a we have a bonding group but you know each year uh, you know and have worked with more people but you're still um, just as humbled every time you're sworn in remind you how beautiful the you know you can be in session for hours and hours and hours in laborious debate some of it crazy, just repetitious and done for PCN. And that's when you stop and start looking around this chamber and say, wow, what a privilege to serve in such a beautiful environment. You know, I'm going to miss that. I have a nice house. It's not this nice. <laughs> no. All right, moving on to your district. Can you describe it? Tell me a little bit about what makes it unique. My district is a treasure. Um, and it's still, it's Lebanon County. And interestingly, I'm, uh, I run from the western border. So, uh, you know, we but abut Hershey, Dairy Township. And I, I'm from Hershey. I grew up in Hershey. We bought a home uh, years ago when we started having kids in Palmyra. So I'm right over the line. Fortunately for me, I've always been in, in a business uh, relationship in Lebanon County. My kids have always gone to the Lebanon County schools. So, um, yeah, the western end was very comfortable for me because it's almost like Hershey, Hershey Palmyra, really, um, or kind of like geographically, it's do you go to Harrisburg or Lebanon if you want a city, and that type of shopping. So uh, that end is very uh, progressive, more a progressive uh, area. But my district ran right down 422. Uh, you went, it's changed with the reapportionment, Anvil and Cleona have come out, but for all those years, um, you went straight down 422 into the city of Lebanon. So you're going through Palmyra, which is a, it's, as a borough, it's not newer, but the development is just, um, you know, much greater than it ever was. And so the people moving in, it's in a higher socioeconomic level and you go through Anvil and Cleona which are great little villages like you know the old-fashioned villages and then you get to the city and all the third class challenges um, we're just a microcosm of Philly and Pittsburgh it's just not as many people it has all the same challenges and and we've got the uh, mix of the registration mix of Republican Democrat which I like because I'm that's more my bend to look at the issue from both sides and make a decision that uh, isn't going to hurt either one. It's going to be the best you can. So that wasn't a problem for me, and I could always get the Democrat vote, uh, fortunately. But then you go out 72 to Mount Gretna. That's a very artsy community. So I, I really enjoyed the artsy um, you know, uh, kind of mindset and input from them. Then you come back up 322, and I have all farm country. Mm -hmm you know, in South Anvil Township, and then you get into South Londonderry Township, which is getting more like Palmyra with growth. And so I was blessed uh, to be able to accommodate, not, not extremes, but there's real differences there. Mm -hmm. But basically, you still have that um, Germanic um, background. It, it, you know, it's a very, uh, it, you know, settled by the Germans. I'm, I'm married to a Swiss German, you know, heritage type person, uh, which has helped me many times in understanding how people think <laughs> in Lebanon County. Uh, but they're incredibly loyal people um, and they're incredibly thoughtful people. So my communication 
has been great with the folks that I represent. I call it a little jewel. We have a lot of successes there, but they're very quiet about it there. Our chamber's outstanding. Our CLA, the business, downtown business community, just are so productive. And they're not isolationists at all, but they take care of themselves. And, and I've really enjoyed helping them do that. So what issues are most important to your constituents? What do they come to you asking about? You know what's important to everybody, and it better be, is the economy. <laughs> it's always jobs. And I've had the privilege of being the chairman of the Labor and Industry Committee here in the House for at least this, uh, this past term, and has brought me right into the trenches. Uh, and my, my tenure as chairman has always focused on everyone needs, deserves, and wants a job. And every job goes through our committee one way or the other. You know, whether it's workers' comp, unemployment comp, and all of the related issues uh, in labor. So my constituents have been very pleased that I took that position uh, because I can communicate with them so much more information than they would get otherwise. Uh, education also. Uh, we have and want a quality education. Without that, we don't have a healthy economy, a healthy environment, all the things I came here for, you know, which is a healthy community for your business, for your family. Uh, you don't have that without quality education. We've struggled with that because my constituency also can't afford to pay, you know, escalating taxes every year to fund education. So one of the issues has been the funding of education as it relates to property taxes. So we've had so much discussion and we've approached it, you know, in so many ways and we still struggle to find a way uh, because I have probably one of the highest senior populations in the state. So you're looking at folks with fixed incomes and uh, nobody wants to see them taxed out of their homes. Uh, so there's got to be a way to manage it a little differently than we have for all of these years. Things have, have changed. and. Uh, we're still struggling with the way to do that because you need to fund education adequately in order to do that. Now, the issue has become primarily health care and how can we access health care and afford health care? So my younger families are all struggling with that because my older seniors at least have Medicare and hopefully some affordable supplemental, but that's even becoming more difficult for them. So. You know, I've got the yin and the yang here with my younger population and their health care needs and affordability, which is becoming harder every day, uh, and my seniors who are getting taxed out of their houses. And in the meantime, everybody wants a good, solid, quality education base for their children. So I would say those are, those are the mix, and one day one's higher issue, and then the next day it's another one, and we, we kind of juggle them back and forth to deal with all of them. <laughs> is it a challenge to keep your constituents informed of issues here in Harrisburg? Your district's not so far, but... No. For me, it's not only because I'm out there so much. I, I wonder how some others do it that live further from home. I live close enough to the capital. There's, there's really a, a good and a hard side to that because people at home just assume that I can get home and be the keynote speaker or you know be part of whatever their event is and I'll break my back trying to do it. But uh, we are in session sometimes till 11 o'clock at night. So uh, it, it's difficult. Uh, but I have a district office staff that I'm so proud of. And they actually can go out and be me. And no one's upset and no one's offended because they know where I am. But it doesn't leave me out of the loop for information and communication. Technology's been a, a, a big help. Um, even our seniors, so many of them now, are, uh, have the technology that uh, they can access. I do weekly email. I tell them everything I'm doing up here every week. I tell them what's happened here on top of what I've been doing. Um, the caucus has uh, systems in place where we can communicate via newsletters through technology sources. So, no, that's uh, actually become easier especially when it's compiled with my ability to be out and my desire to be out with them. So we've been very blessed in that form. Um, what legislative funding has impacted your district the most or are you proud of assisting with? 
the funding part of it, well, we've struggled lately, right, with funding, you know, when you're looking. I must say, um, I have a fabulous city school district, and they really struggle. We have a population, it's a little transient. We have a Latino population that's pretty significant, and uh, when they come and stay, that's wonderful and fine. But if they're going in and out, and they're leaving half the year and going to New York or going back to Puerto Rico and then coming back. It's very hard on the school and their testing levels and therefore their funding levels and so on. So I have really prioritized their needs and having served on appropriations for almost my entire tenure, I've always had the opportunity to be at that table to talk about funding and education funding and, and so on. Uh, so when I, when I came into office at that time, we still had our um, legislative grant initiatives and what people call WAMs. And what they really were, they don't exist anymore. But it gave us an opportunity to identify in our districts where real needs were. And there really wasn't access for them. Um, and I was able to do, do that while they were here. Uh, you know, we'd be able to get funding for refrigeration at the senior center. These are the things people were complaining about being whams. Uh, but they, they do the noon meals for our older folks. And uh, they desperately needed refrigeration. So, you know, we were able to help direct some of those funds. But uh, that ended some time ago. And, that we're not that's not accessible to us anymore so the funding that i've been able to do is to make really good decisions at the appropriations table having had the opportunity i've been appointed to appropriations so i'm very much a fair and balanced person so i want to see that you know everybody is taken care of as best we can with the limited tax dollars we have Moving on to talk about some of the legislation, which you've already mentioned, you've gotten a lot yes, successfully yes, thank, made thank, into law. Thank goodness, yes. Um, during your first and second terms in office, you sponsored a bill regarding gender-motivated violence, um, which mm -hmm. passed the House, but it died in the Senate. That happens sometimes here. It does. Um, how did you become involved in that legislation? Effort? Well, that's a good question. Remember I told you, you know, where do these ideas come from? Where does good legislation come from? Uh, sometimes it's something you're just paying attention to yourself and it's a more global statewide issue. Uh, that would be a statewide issue, of course, but the genesis was very local. Before I came into office, um, one of the other things that I'd like to do for exercise and again, but sharing, is yoga. So I became involved in volunteering to teach yoga classes at our domestic violence. Was one in one in uh, Derry Township actually, and one in Lebanon County. Um, that brought me up front and very personal with a, a number of individuals who are living in a violent domestic situation. And I can remember the one time I I did one uh, uh, session, and oh, it was I did it because it built up confidence. Uh, you know, yoga postures um, are done in, with your own control. Your own, you're in charge of your own body, and you're going into a posture and holding it by your own choice, right? Uh, so I thought it was a confidence builder, which it obviously was because everybody came. But this one woman came, and she had just she had cast on her legs, cast on her arm. I mean, she, had, she was beaten terribly. And it was right before Easter probably the weekend before Easter that I was out there. And she's struggling to go in positions with Cass and all of this. Lovely lady. And I talked to her about Easter and what, it, what they were going to do at the, the center, the, vi the domestic violence center. Oh, 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 no, I have to, I'll have to go home. And I said, what do you mean? Oh, no, I, I have to be home. I have to be home to make Easter dinner. Oh, I have to. That's my responsibility or I'll, I'll get beaten again. And I remember talking to that woman and saying, no, the, you know, there's, there's, there's people here to help you and your, your children, you know. It, it was such a raw experience for me uh, that I was determined that there has to be more we can do to identify, help, and protect folks. And it can be a man or a woman. There was only one time I ran into a, a, a gentleman. It was m mostly women just by you know, virtue of what I, my experience was. But, uh, that was the genesis of that bill. And then 
you can imagine how disappointed you are when it makes it through the legislative process in the House, meaning it was fully vetted. It's good. It's constitutional. It's timely. It's all those things. It goes to Senate. They either don't have the same interest or the same timeline. They run out of time. We run out of time so often here, and good legislation goes to bed forever unless someone else picks it up, which I'm determined will happen <laughs> with, with some of mine that are left. Thanks for asking about yeah. that. I moved on years later to child protection. Obviously, those are issues that I care Related. a lot about. Mm -hmm. um, you introduced legislation in the 2011-2012 session um, aimed at amending the way the Department of Public Welfare or Human Services operates, essentially dealing, um, detailing medical assistance for inmates and oh, eligibility one, yeah. of assistance and more. Yeah, um, yeah. Would you describe what motivated that legislation and are you pleased you know, with... You're, you're going back a ways because I've done a couple welfare related bills. The one you're talking about, that was that specific to... Uh, and was it was it signed into law or you're at 22 all right act 22 is a different story <laughs> that was compiled act 22 actually became the welfare code mm -hmm. that year in the budget um, you want to talk about a legislator having a surprise uh, you know you my bill was very specific very well defined as it relates to the eligibility component of accessing you know the public assistance programs that we have. So it passes in the House, just like the bill we talked about before, because over to the Senate. Interesting thing can happen in the Senate. Uh, your bill can become a vehicle for something else. Uh, they can enhance it, uh, maybe make it better, add some things that strengthens it and sends it back and you're happy. They can take your bill, use it as a vehicle because they, um, especially if it has anything to do with raising funds or generating revenue because those bills all have to start in the House, but if they end up over in the Senate, they become a vehicle for some things that uh, they might want to get done over there and, and wouldn't be able to. So it may come back in a form that you don't like at all. That puts you in an interesting position. Or it can happen this way. I mean, they take a very good, solid welfare bill and actually load the whole welfare code into it, which in this case ended up being a really good thing. There weren't, there were not things at it that I disagreed with. So when it came back under my name as the welfare code, um, it was a surprise to me and it's also a surprise to know then you have to handle the bill on the floor <laughs> and it's now the welfare code. Um, that was quite an experience and um, I didn't have a lot of time to prepare for that. I had to be ready and get to know what, but I was on appropes, so that helped me at being on appropriations. There was a lot of it I knew already that they were thinking about loading into there. So that was um, exciting in a number of ways. It became the full welfare code. They did not remove any of my language, so they built on my language, and that has helped a tremendous amount in welfare. Um, we need to just make sure people meet all the criteria and are eligible because we're stretching dollars to the max to be able to provide. And I could keep going back to the escalating senior population because that's where most of the money goes into Medicaid health care for seniors and long-term care. We have a lot of people in skilled care levels that are on Medicaid. And now we, we have created, uh, since I've been here, home and community-based services, which allows people in need of 24-7 skilled care to live at home. And the Medicaid is paying for the care that they get at home. Uh, and I th think that's a good direction for folks to give them that option. My concern, um, which would lead back to that one bill that I said still isn't passed, uh, there's not a lot of oversight. <laughs> there's not enough oversight, let's say. So things can happen out in the home that relate to, you know, neglect and um, even abuse sometimes. I, 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 we need to see that oversight improved. Absolutely. Um, last term, you authored legislation that would require mandated reporter slash child abuse um, mm -hmm. recognition training. Can you explain that? Yeah, that was part of uh, the, the package of bills that came out from Governor Corbett's Child Abuse Task Force, which was unfortunately a result of the very high profile situation we saw uh, at Penn State with um, Sandusky as a coach. 
horrifying experience. What's horrifying is to know that this goes on in many, many, many other places and that it took something like that <laughs> to get the action. So naturally, that was something that I was willing to participate in. Interestingly enough, before I introduced those bills as part of the package and the team of us you know, worked on that, I had introduced a bill uh, which is, was now signed into law uh, that deals with child exploitation awareness. We combined it in order to get it passed in the Senate because it wasn't going anywhere. We combined it with a suicide awareness. They're not always related. I'm not saying that every child that's sexually abused, you know, ends up committing suicide, but they're not that far apart. There are many situations. So uh, in statute, it worked to put them both together. But my portion was um, very specific to exploitation awareness. Children don't know what's happening to them. The, they need to be taught, and they're not always hearing at home because, sadly, most of the time, it's happening at home. Uh, which is hard for many of us to get our heads around, but uh, having gotten so much more involved over the years, I, I, I'm a realist now. So uh, this particular bill, which is now law, uh, it, it requires K-8 to education incorporated into the health mm -hmm. curriculum in all our schools, along with the Department of Education uh, approving the program and providing the program if they don't have access to one. There's a lot of great programs out there. But that will help children understand. It's never going to stop if a child doesn't understand what's happening to them. You know, if it's someone they know, love, and respect, or maybe fear, has them convinced that this is normal and it's all behind a very dark curtain and no one's ever going to get behind that curtain if the child doesn't himself or herself know. So that, to me, was even a more important bill than the training bills. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry, I had to talk a little bit about that. Oh, so ahead. we were successful in getting, getting that done. Very good. Um, you got involved in some local sort of legislation issues. I um, did. During your first and second terms, you sponsored a bill that would provide a public record of those owing delinquent taxes. Correct. That became Act 12, as well as amending laws regarding maintenance of taxes by the collector, um, the mailing of delinquency notices, mm -hmm. etc. Act 80. Were these issues that you were involved with in the county level previous to your housework, or what made you champion these issues? Okay, they were situations I knew ought to be dealt with based on my experience locally. The other privilege and honor that I've had here in the legislature uh, is to be appointed to the local government commission. The local, and that's, that's a bipartisan, which is my favorite environment, uh, body, the commission, and it's comprised of five House members and five Senate members. And we look in a bipartisan manner and a bicameral, unusual, Senate and House at what issues relate to our municipal codes because that's what the commission is. They're very complicated and they vary a great deal. So some of them are old, some of them are complicated, duplicated, all of those things. So we look at those issues and those that I knew more about uh, or had more passion and interest in, then I would take the lead on them. And so it was a combination of the local government commission interests, the agenda that we put together as a commission and then carrying the ones that were most important to you, in this case, me. Uh, and of course, I have a third class city. So I saw some blight and I saw, you know, buildings deteriorating because taxes weren't being paid, the places were vacated and you know, slum landlords that are just letting it hang and other people are affected and, you know, and the tax base is suffering because they're not paying their taxes. So that's really why I got it. But see, I told you earlier, all your experience before you get here is valuable when you serve in this role. I tell that to young people all the time, start at the local level. Get that experience. You know, don't come fresh out of college and say, I'm gonna be a career politician at either in state level or the federal level. You're not bringing anything but book knowledge. You know, real life, exp and that, that kind of is a good example of that. Um, in 2011-2012 session, you had legislation that would change the way um, local police officers and local paid fire uh, fighters are hired, and there were some provisions about them running for office. Um, can right. you explain that? Right. Well, now listen here again. That, that was a local government commission bill, 
And the reason I had that bill and championed that bill uh, was my interest level and experience. My dad was a state policeman. So he taught at the State Police Academy. Uh, my, several of my nephews are with the State Police, my nephews with the Derry Township Police. So I knew firsthand the complications sometimes of um, the political aspect. Now, you know, by statute, they're not allowed to take an active role. But what can you, you know, professionally? But what could you do as a private citizen was sketchy. It was just kind of sketchy. Uh, as I said to you, many of the laws aren't clear or they're outdated or whatever. And that was one of them. And uh, the local government worked, worked well with all the stakeholders on that to be able to clarify what you can and what you cannot do as a professional law enforcement uh, individual because they bring a lot to the table. And I don't, we didn't want their rights infringed upon either. And of course now, you know, as we're seeing uh, in our, our society and culture, there's just a lot going on with law enforcement and the role they have, sadly, have to play in elections because people aren't behaving. So, you know, you need to separate what you can do as a law enforcement professional and what you can do as, you know, Joe Jones, uh, you know, citizen. So I'm so glad we did that. You know, these, some of the things you're bringing up are not all the sexiest issues in the world that a lot of legislators could say, oh, this is going to get a lot of press. It's going to make me look good. Guess what? This, this helps. All the things we've done really help people and make the community a healthy place. Um, again, I have a few more. <laughs> My goodness, you're full of questions. <laughs> I am. Uh, last term, Act 37 was signed, which involved planned communities and con com condominiums, uh, a consumer protection type of bill. Uh, can you explain your involvement in that? Uh, I'm thinking, well, I'm looking back, and again, I had, had a few uh, involvements with the condominium one, but the one that I, if it's not that act, I'm going to have to think of what it is, but very, very important issue related uh, to that. Where I live and where I represent is a part of Pennsylvania. It's not the only uh, legislative district affected, but uh, because we're built on a limestone karst geology, uh, we have a lot of sinkholes. And especially, I'm very aware of them because on the western end of the county, in the borough of Palmyra, where I served locally, we're very flat with no water access out. So as they started developing all around the borough of Palmyra, just so much more water flowed into this flat area in the borough where water has to go somewhere and water decides where it's going to go. So it's going to go down generally, then go up. So it takes along with it this crumbling limestone. Uh, and you know, over time, it, we used to call them depressions because sinkholes was very deep depressing so with little dimples but I was well aware of those issues so in my district I saw one um, some years back probably uh, about the time you're talking where um, a home literally disappeared in into a humongous sinkhole in a development of condos and single homes uh, where the builders required to include a retention, detention basin to collect the water. Well, anyhow, it's generally on somebody's property. So this gentleman who lost his home, that basin was on his property. Well, when he bought the house, uh, his understanding was he was just getting a bigger lot than everybody else because the detention basin was on it. And that all he had to do was mow it, you know, and, but no one really was obligated to watch that basin to make sure there was adequate. The builder met all the requirements at the time. Requirements changed after that, but he met them all at the time. The person was pleading ignorance, which he may or may not have understood, you know, that this was on his property. Um, tried in every possible way I could to help those folks and to get this remediated. By the way, it's still an open sinkhole because no one is taking responsibility for it. I don't want that to happen again. So we worked on legislation that would require disclosure, literally know for sure that the person who's buying the property understands what's on their property and their responsibilities to that. So that ignorance can't be part of, you know, I couldn't change the law, the, all the real estate laws that exist, but we could manage to make that a requirement 
that was not easy to get past and had to work very closely with the realtors, with builders, with taxpayer property owners. Just tremendously interesting work and successfully got it done. Um, you've done a lot of legislation pertaining to our older Pennsylvanians. Yes. Do you have any that stick out in your mind as being sort of most important that you? Well, you know on? what? Again, not a real sexy one, but uh, they're all they were all they're all important. And again, I go back to the you know the one that's not passed that I'd like to see passed, which has much more to do with neglect on, in care dependent people. But many, many, many folks need skilled care. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we, we really need to work with our communities that can provide that. It's so hard for them to uh, balance their you know, revenue sheets because there's so much Medicaid, growing numbers, uh, not so much uh, you know, fee for service, pay as you go. You run out of money pretty quickly and you end up on Medicaid. So uh, I've been of a mind to work as best we can with them you know, all the way along the line. This could be such a simple thing, but it's so critical to them. It's the dispute resolution when somebody, um, you know, ha has a concern about a level of care or, you know, a, a process they're using or whatever. And uh, before this, it was such a antiquated and laborious process, and there were ways to make it work much better and more quickly for both, you know, issues, whatever, both sides of the issue, that made a tremendous difference to the providers of long-term care. And um, as much as I am an advocate for the senior themselves, no matter what their circumstances, uh, in order for them to access quality care, you have to make sure you're doing everything uh, to uh, have it work well, and, and that's, that's one of the ones I saw there. Uh, the protection element on, on neglect and abuse is, is still a huge pending one, and I've spent so much time dealing with that. Um, is there any other legislation that sticks out in your mind that I didn't bring up today you know that you'd what? like to talk about? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, very pleased with the ones you brought up because <laughs> I haven't thought about them for a while. Uh, and, and again, not one of the 16 or 17 are more important to me than others, I would not have done them unless I knew they were going to mean a lot to a lot of people in Pennsylvania. One you didn't talk about, but I go back to my professional background. I told you I was a medical technologist to begin with. I worked at the Hershey Medical Center and I worked in hematology. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the areas that I was very close to was blood donation having enough blood factor, having healthy blood factor uh, to um, be used in a situation like Hershey Medical Center, which is large and a trauma hospital and all of, all of that. So it was a big element there. So I've always been involved and interested in it. So take me to the level where I'm at now. Uh, and again, going into the community in so many levels, which I've always wanted to do and have done, I've been very involved with Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, uh, the big brothers, big sisters, anything that gives kids a structure that I know is going to be a positive experience. So scouting is one of them. One of the scouting troops in my district experienced um, a loss of life for a very uh, a young girl. She was about eight or nine years old and she died of an aneurysm suddenly in, in their community. And these Boy Scouts just really wanted to do something. So this is a long time ago now. This is probably uh, not quite a decade ago, but probably close to that. And these young scouts decided what they could do was orchestrate a blood drive so that they could they felt like they were paying back her blood debt so to speak you know in other words they hadn't used a lot of blood on the little gown she didn't make it but the family was looking for people to give blood in her name they put this thing together they do it every single year okay i've always been with them so i've watched these boys go from 12 to teenagers now and some of them are college graduates and adults. However, I would always give blood. I'd be the first one to give blood just to set the mood and then I would stay and talk to all the donors and, um, and I'd always uh, help them publicize that they were gonna do it and so on. They started asking me over the years, why can't we give blood too? And they were by that time like 15 or 16. And they go, Look at us, you know, we're big strong boys. We could give blood too. And then I'd explain to them by statute uh, you know, uh, 
thus law. Uh, you can't give blood until you're 17 with parental permission and then meet the other eligibility requirements. And all the time I'm thinking, boy, these boys are right. A whole aging population is aging out of the ability to give blood. You know, they're older, they're on medication. More and more people were going on medication early, like they stick you on cholesterol medicine when you're 50 now, you know. Then uh, there are certain medications that, you know, screen you out. You can't give blood. So if you have people getting too old and you have people on medication, you have people traveling so much more now, going to countries where, um, you know, there are viruses and different unique situations, health situations, where you come back, you can't give blood for three years. Well, now they're out of the mix. I'm thinking, you know, these young folks might have a point here. Maybe I'll look into this. So I did. And I started doing my due diligence on how we came to this, you know, structure. Could we look? Did research, me, my staff, staff in here, and what goes on in other states, what works, medical society, hospital administrators, all, all the people that would be key. Uh, we found out that we could probably deal with a change here. And I introduced legislation um, that you can now, and pass legislation, that you can now donate blood at 16 meeting the same eligibility and parental permission. Um, when I was with uh, the Med Center and Central Pennsylvania Blood Bank, I used to do all their PR in high schools. So I would go out and do assemblies um, to high school students a week before the blood mobile would come. And I would literally be like a road show, <laughs> getting kids psyched about giving blood, especially young men. You try to get a man to give blood and they'll find a million reasons not to. A young high school man will do it because they don't want to look like a sissy or whatever <laughs> to their friends. So they push each other to go, if you donate one time, you realize it's not hard. And they become lifetime donors. So I had already been involved in encouraging kids be to give blood before I came here, met these scouts, talked, you know, it's, the genesis was theirs. It's now signed into law. And their picture, a one of the teenagers giving, scouts, giving blood, is on the picture with the governor and I signing the bill. Uh, you ask what bill, it's not probably, I'll, you know what, it could be one of the most important ones. I had calls from surgeons that I know uh, afterwards that just thanked me profusely. So you don't know what it's like to have a lot of more orthopedic surgeons, so I don't know if it goes that way or not. But he said, you know, having a patient on the table and having an unexpected bleeder, and you're looking for the matching blood factor, and, and they're, they don't have it. And you're running, getting runners from hospital to hospital. There's no substitute for your blood or my blood in somebody who needs it, or we might need it. So uh, they were ecstatic over the bill. So I'm like, okay, maybe nobody else thinks it's exciting, but they do in medicine. The scouts were so proud of themselves. And we've got a lot more new donors that hopefully will be lifetime donors. So that's probably one I'd point out that we didn't talk about. So um, what was your strength as a legislator? Hmm. My strengths as a legislator. Um, building coalitions is everything here. Um, some people do it better than others. Some people do it very naturally. And some people struggle to do it and some people learn it. Um, again, I probably have to go back to my childhood and being raised in such a large family. Um, I use the example even with my own four kids when I'm in my classrooms. By the way, I go to all my fourth grade classrooms in the whole district because that's when they're studying Pennsylvania government. So I like for them to get, you know, firsthand look at that. But coming to an agreement is, is the hardest part. I can't pass a bill with my one yay button, you know? I've got to have at least 102 minimum <laughs> vote with me in order to get something done legislatively here. So building coalitions on both sides of the aisle has been probably uh, my greatest skill. Um, That's but it's sort thing. of a natural thing for me. I come from a large family. Do you think all 10 of us could have what we wanted? No. So we had to come together, you know, and say, let's ask mom or dad for this. Is it something that's going to work for all of us? Or, you know, and if one kid tried to stand out and make themselves more important, you know, be arrogant about it, and you're a loser. <laughs> so 
I think I learned that, and I tell the kids in school, you know, my four kids, and dad's at work, and I'm at work, and they're at school, and they're at practice, and we come home and say, we don't have time to cook, so where do you want to go for dinner? And they all have a dinner. One likes friendlies because you get free ice cream, or somebody likes Pizza Hut, the big, fat, greasy stuff, and, you know, <laughs> and then somebody just wants a milkshake at McDonald's. And, you know, I'd say to them, look, you four come together and decide, or we're staying home and we're eating peanut butter because it has protein. So <laughs> they very quickly come together and say, well, maybe we'll go to Friendly's tonight and the next time we'll go to Pizza Hut. Um, I've always done that and I've always, you know, knew that I just am not that important by myself. <laughs> it takes a team no matter what you're doing. So I think building coalitions here and being a person, a member of integrity. Everybody that has served with me for 14 years knows they can trust me and they know I'm going to tell them the truth. And as a chairman, um, that, that's, that's a challenge. It's not always easy. Um, but, you know, if it's a bill that I think is good and timely and I can get behind it with you, I'm going to run it for you in committee. If I don't think it's the right time and I don't think that we can get the support to get out of committee, I'm going to tell you that too and I'm going to tell you why. And if I have some guidance on what you can do to get more information, you know, for the members, I'm going to do that too. So I think the trust, integrity, and then being able to use that to build coalitions, that's probably it. Um, you were the first woman elected as a rep representative to serve Lebanon County. Correct. Um, are there any challenges or advantages to being a female in the House? We've, we've mentioned being a female in the House a little, but... I, yeah, I did. We've talked a little bit about that. Um, the the challenge, uh, I've never seen it as a challenge, by the way, although you'll hear that from a lot of uh, females who serve at different levels, but it depends on the mix you're in, you know. Um, the older, I mean, more tenured serving members here, um, some of them might have a little different attitude about uh, a woman's perspective. Um, because maybe their relationships with women are of a, you know, just a little bit different time element. I happened to see on Facebook, it popped up, uh, a list of uh, things that were critical to um, a wife in the 1950s. And it was hysterical to someone like us, but my mom, my 93-year-old mom was with me. I'm reading these to her, and I'm laughing, and she's going, well, that's not really funny because that's what we did. You know, in the 1950s, um, you know, your spouse's opinion was paramount and yours wasn't, and it said that. So you imagine being raised that way or being in relationships like that. So I have a great deal of respect for generations and life experience. So there was a little bit of that here. Look, I wasn't 22 when I came in here. Um, you know, I was a woman with experience, uh, professional experience and education. Um, so credibility for me wasn't that difficult. That's what, that's cornerstone here. You have to build credibility among the other members. And there are more men than women, and that's all there is to it. Most of the women here are outstanding people that I'm both sides of the aisle, outstanding. Uh, and they worked hard to get here. They've done a lot of different things before they came here. So they bring a lot to the table. We don't want to be seen as women. We don't go to this great extent to say, you know, I'm a female. No, I'm a legislator. No matter whether I wear skirt or pants, I wear them both. Uh, so our attitude is such that there really shouldn't be any difference. So we pretty much don't accept any difference. And uh, therefore, you don't have a lot of gender challenges. The gender challenges are where you sit on the house floor. If you're stuck in the middle and you gotta get out to go to the bathroom and you're wearing a skirt and the styles have always been a little shorter since I've been here, it's awkward. <laughs> <laughs> and this uh, building was not built for women. Uh, it was built in 1906. There were no women welcome. Uh, never mind legislators. Uh, there, were, there was a woman's sitting room up where the lieutenant governor's office is now. And they stuffed you in there if you had a reason to be here. So finding a bathroom was a little tricky here because, you know, and we don't have a, we don't really have a members, and they still call it members lounge. So I think that means we could all go in it, but mm -mm. 
I'll go to the ladies' little lounge with, you know, a bathroom and a nice little table where I can sit down and go through my emails. But um, it's designed for men, and that aura will never leave here. That aura will always be here. But the women who come now are just um, really prepared for it, I think, mostly. You know, years past, the first women who came into the house, not all of them, many of them replaced spouses and died. Mm -hmm. and then, first of all, I don't want to lose my spouse, and that wasn't the way I wanted to come. Uh, so, you know, the women are different now, too. So, yeah, I think that the challenges um, are not great, and if you, allow them, if you allow them to be great, then that's your own personal struggle as a woman. Why do you think more women don't pursue a career? They don't want to. It's simple. Um, women are, I go right back, we are, we're better educated. Um, we have more opportunities. And going way back when I told you when I was in high school, well, you know, go into medicine, teaching, or social work. Uh, it, so women are, are better prepared for so many more things now. Um, the opportunities are there. So why do they want to come into this raucous world? And it is a raucous world of politics. Politics is tough. So that's why when I leave here, I will be devoting more of my time, I always have, but more of my time to uh, developing leadership, public and political leadership among young women. Uh, I want them to know and understand it and make an informed choice because the investment is not just for you. It's for your family and your community, and we need more. And it's not that they're not welcome. There's not that they can't do it. If I did it, anybody, any woman can do it. Um, they're just not inclined to choose it. Um, and it's our job to go out and invest in our replacement parts. So I do a lot of work with Penn State, their leadership programs, Chathams. You know, I go both ways as far as the political side goes. I, you know, these are issues, not, not partisan, you know, agendas. So I, I work with young women and the Einstein group. Of course, I've always worked with developing women in leadership. So uh, I think we need to do that. I think we have a responsibility to do that. And they're not coming because I don't think anyone's out there telling them how badly we need them. Um, I want to talk just briefly about some of the committees. Like you've mentioned a few that you've been, you've had the opportunity mm -hmm. to chair and beyond. What did you enjoy most or what were you most particularly proud of working on? Again, uh, I'm really proud of everything that we got done. I want to think back. I've been a chairman for a while, and when you're a chairman, then you don't get to serve on all the other committees anymore. Uh, so when I started out, and, and it's really good because they do ask you where you'd like to serve when you come in. They can't always accommodate you, but they look at areas where you have some experience. So. Uh, early on, I was on the Health uh, Committee and Human Services Committee, a local government, obviously, uh, aging and older uh, adult services. Th those were probably my four. I've also been on state government as well as local government. So I've always um, focused on areas that I knew a lot about. Interestingly, and I loved every one of them, and was, I think, over things you and I have talked about, you can see I probably got something done in every committee that I served on. Um, I've never left the Aging and Older Adult Services Committee. I could keep one after I became a chairman. And I just felt that uh, I was someone in the body of the assembly that knew more about that than a lot of other people based on my industry experience. So I've always stayed involved there. But I also was on appropriations, which was key. Um, the Local Government Commission wouldn't have traded that for anything, but I was also a whip. I was a deputy whip for years. Um, really valued that. I saw so much um, potential uh, to work in that whip area. It, you know, it really is simply an analogy of what they do in Parliament and, and the symbol is a whip, like we go out and whip people to vote for certain <laughs> things. Um, they might have done that in Parliament, we don't. Uh, so our job would be, uh, as deputies, they'd break, they'd break it down into, I call them my whiplets, a certain group of members that I always communicated with on important issues. Every week we met as deputy whips with whoever, who I served under three different whips. Uh, but I always knew what was going on. You knew what the agenda was for the week. You knew what leadership's perspective was even before you went to caucus. So um, then that would give 
us an opportunity to talk to our whiplets, our list. Uh, where are you on this issue? Can I get you more information? The, the caucus uh, would like to go this way. We just hope our members can get there with us. Uh, the, the more our numbers increased in our majority, the harder, harder that became. So I think being in leadership now is probably the most difficult time in the history. We, with the most recent election, the Republican caucus, the majority caucus will be at 122. And you talk about herding cats and trying to with all those different, you know, we all come in here with really strong opinions on what's right for our people, what's right for Pennsylvania. Um, bringing them into that coalition that you need of 102 or more is difficult. But being a whip gave me an advantage to talking in depth on issues to those folks and helping leadership get us where we need it to be. So every single committee and every leadership, and I'm on rules, oh my goodness, uh, rules is really critical uh, most times, and boy, at budget, at end of session now, where stuff is flying back from the Senate and it has to go through rules before it goes to the floor. Uh, I'm honored to have been chosen to serve on those committees. So they've all been uh, very productive. Um. Did you have any mentors when you began your career here in the House? You're talking about political mentors. I've had a lot of me mentors in my life. I'll go back first to my grandmother. Uh, my uh, parents grew up in Scranton, Pennsylvania. My dad only came down here with the State Police Academy, so they're Scrantonians, real coal crackers, you know. So my grandmother raised, this is my dad's mother, raised nine children herself. But my mother tells me, and that was her mother-in-law, and she adored her, which is a nice thing if you adore your mother-in-law, but she's always telling me how much I'm like my grandmother. And I can remember being at my grandmother's home, and I can just remember putting a hat on and going to a meeting. <laughs> and it was PTO or something, you know, in the local government area. She didn't run for office, but she was always in some type of leadership community position, church position. And um, I was the oldest grandchild as well as the oldest kid in our family. So I had the privilege of tagging with her a lot. And I, I can just remember being stuck in different places with her. I can remember being in, in the Catholic church and laying down in the pew and going to sleep because she was leading some group of them. So I, you know what? I think she was a mentor even though I was just a little kid. Um, and my parents, of course, they taught me responsibility on every level of life. You can't discount that. Uh, and then when I got into the government realm, um, there was a borough manager when I ran for office. Now, she was not an elected position, but she, re you know, she worked for the borough. So she really, really knew the uh, legislative process in local government. And uh, I, uh, it's amazing how much I learned from her. And she must have seen something in me at that level, that she, she gave me an awful lot of encouragement on moving into other elected public service type positions. And then when I finally made that decision, I have to give the gentleman credit, Representative Ed Krebs, Krebs that preceded me. Uh, I'd have to say he was a mentor of sorts about this in particular. Then when I got here, of course, he's gone, so he wasn't a mentor in here. So um, I chose my mentors in here. Um, I looked at the body, and I looked at the women. I identified the women. Before I even came in, I contacted now Senator Pat Vance, mm -hmm. whom you may be talking to because Senator Vance is retiring as I am. But when I came in, she was in the House. and. Um, I knew her indirectly, didn't know her directly, but it had been recommended to me that I have a conversation with her. I was looking for a woman that has done the job. I needed to ask womanly questions like, how many nights are you home for dinner with your family? What is it really like in the time commitment? Those kinds of things, you know, because guys didn't care if they got home for dinner, but, you know, I would like to have time with my family. I called, uh, well, I had an I called her, she said, I'd be happy to talk to you. I had run, won the primary, so being in a Republican district, we were fairly confident that I most likely would, would win and be here. So we both decided to spend the time. Uh, we set the date. The date was 9-11. The date was on the infamous 9-11. I was still involved with the borough. 
that morning when it happened, I was at a meeting in Lebanon, and um, we, it was taking place in a uh, like a restaurant environment, and the person serving came over to the table and said, uh, I hate to interrupt your meeting, but you may want to come to the TV. A plane just went into the, the town, one of the first tower. And we're aghast, we fly to them. We, we saw the second one happen on the screen. Horrifying to all of us and to this country. Now keep in mind, I have an appointment with Senator Vance in the afternoon. So I take care of everything I need that I can and am responsible for with the borough. And uh, then I make a call to her office and uh, uh, to determine what we were going to do. And she said, we've been evacuated from the Capitol building. And so she said, I'm in my district office in Camp Hill. She said, if you can make your way here uh, this afternoon, it probably might be the only time I'll be able to meet with you, depending on what happens. I said, wow, <laughs> OK, I'll, I'll do my best. I was able to go, took care of what I was doing. When I came from my area in Palmyra across the South Bridge to cross the river, I was the only car on the road. And I'll never forget how that felt, knowing what had happened that day and what was in store for us. And I had, at that point, made my decision to run. I won the primary, obviously. But psychologically, I was still 60, 40 percent. You know, I, you know, I got all my attributes, all my experience. But then any person, and women more than men, look at their limitations sometimes. And a lot of that was, what am I doing to my family kind of thing. I needed to talk to someone like her. Having that conversation with her, talking about that serving the mundane part of it and what was happening to the world that day made my decision and she my discussion with her just she said we need you and it was that simple so from then on I moved forward enthusiastically she became my mentor in the house added to that entourage Katie True who had served prior but left to run for lieutenant governor ran again came in in my class so um, she was someone I really looked up to for the decision-making process. And at that time, we had Eleanor Taylor. And for anybody looking at anything of interest in the history of Pennsylvania, look at Eleanor Taylor's service to the General Assembly. She was a former teacher. Uh, she came with that uh, classroom control attitude. She was the chairman of our caucus. So every one of our caucus meetings, with all of us in the Republican Party in one room looking at the agenda, trying to come together on support and sometimes behaving and sometimes not. She'd be up there with that gavel and slam it down and say, you gentlemen can either seat, take a seat or leave the room. <laughs> and I'm like, whoa, I can't believe she's trying to boss around the other member. But we couldn't hear and she was trying to keep order. And she would come to me and as a new member and uh, She'd reinforce what she thought was good behavior, maybe, on my part. But she was an old-fashioned woman. She was in her 80s. Um, and if she didn't like some of what she saw among some of the younger female members, she'd come to me and say, why don't you have a talk with them? <laughs> why don't you have a talk with them, Maury? And it was, it, it was interesting, um, you know, and because uh, if she did it, it would come off as, go stand in the corner and put the dunce cap on, you know. But it, if, if it was me being a newer member to a younger person than me, even newer member, it was always a good conversation. And her advice to me, Eleanor Taylor, I said, you know, I said, do you have any early words of wisdom? This is when I first came in. She said, well, I'll tell you, don't carry a purse with you. <laughs> I said, okay, I don't have to carry a purse. No. She said, if you carry a purse, they know you're a woman right off the bat. And I remember saying to her, Chairman Taylor, if that's the only way they know, going to know I'm a woman, I'm in trouble. <laughs> I, said, I have never carried a purse in the house. So I had mentors in many different levels, <laughs> even in how to behave and whether or not to carry a purse. And uh, it was funny. I just, I just didn't. I mean, it wasn't even conscious that I was not going to carry a big bag with me. Nope, I use my, uh, you know, my binder with zippers and all that stuff. My phone's in there. My badges are in there. And I don't carry a purse. <laughs> Thank you. She's in heaven now, I'm sure. <laughs> Chairman Taylor. Um, what was your relationship with the media, and was it different here in Harrisburg hmm. versus your home district? Well, 
I've never had any problems with the media. You know, I get probably the market I'm in, it's not, we're not Philly, we're not Pittsburgh, and yeah. they're not out to get you. I've never had to deal with the kind of uh, media that trails you to print something, you know, negative. Uh, they were, they've always been, to me, they've always been pretty fair. Uh, and because we're smaller, I guess, uh, in a smaller market, and newspapers, media has changed so much, we'd have to talk about when I came in versus now, really, because uh, it's mostly online, all of it now, and I think people miss so much now that it's online, you know, and, and the older folks complain all the time because they don't have a newspaper to open, you know, um, and we don't send out newsletters in print because it, you know, it's costly to do that. So we try to save money and do it. So I'll print up um, a certain amount, a small amount of newsletters and keep them in my office because the population that comes into the district office is often an older population. And they'll grab one and they're just so excited to see it in print. So I don't spend a lot of money doing it. We do most of it via, you know, the internet. Uh, but uh, we don't, we have one local paper that's still in print and they print every press release I have and cover every bill. So, you know, it's, it's not really, really sophisticated, but it gets information out to folks. So, no, during campaigns, of course, you know, you'll say, boy, I wish I wouldn't have printed that or whatever. But no, there's, I've never had any real difficulty. Here, the people covering uh, here in the Capitol uh, have always, often, not always, often come to me, the journalists, Channel 27, Channel 21, all the local, because I'm a local person, uh, they'll just grab me in the halls and say, all right, what's going on? And then I'm happy to tell them, and I'm very comfortable with the media. Um, is it becoming harder to overcome party differences in lawmaking, or is it really just stayed the same? Yeah, I've seen a change in that. Uh, not for me, because I'm just not going to operate that way. Uh, but I, I've seen that happen. It's a trickle-down effect, you know, you see it, you see it in Washington and the tremendous divisiveness, my goodness, and the, you know, almost total lack of civility. Uh, it, it wasn't that way when I came here at all. Our caucus room was extremely statesmanlike, exactly what I thought it should be. Uh, respect shown for the person speaking, um, respect for their opinion although yours is going to differ and you're going to stand up and say, you know, I really respect the work you're doing and the opinion, you know, where I live and what I see in my perspective isn't exactly there yet. Um, and, and again, maybe I'll, I don't know, uh, I guess it was just an attitude of the masses at the time, or it was Eleanor Taylor slamming down that gavel and saying, you know, I need some quiet and consideration in here. Uh, but with the newer folks that have come in over the past, I don't even know how many terms I'd say, it's been a while now, uh, we're, we're getting more people coming in on agenda driven, which are very partisan. So then they're, they're not open to discussion and they're pretty confident in the way they want to do it. Things like the pension has brought it, but we, we need pension reform, you know, there's no question about it. Uh, not only can we not agree on exactly how to do that, but how it can actually work. So we've had quite a number of people come in in recent years thinking, I got the solution. Here's what we're going to do. Well, you know, when you get here, you find out that piece is fine, but you got to get the other pieces to fit, and they don't. So I, I, I've seen some changes there. So I think partisanism uh, is a little more divisive than it used to be. We always had to, there's got to, there's two parties because there's generally two opinions or many, many more on issues, but see, I think they're all valid until you hash them all out, and give them a worthy debate. Um, so yes, I think it has changed. Uh, it has not affected me, because, uh, but I'm leaving now. So how it will be after I leave, I don't know. I've been able to work um, on both sides of the aisle, and generally we, I've put together a package that uh, people love to hate, let's put it that way. You know, nobody totally loves it. Nobody totally hates it, so that probably means it's good, right? You didn't get everything you want. You got some of what you wanted. Again, that goes back to my growing up in a family of 10 where I, you know, none of us could have all the cake. You, you only got a certain size cake. One very big, by the way, <laughs> you know, when you split it that many ways. So I was maybe more satisfied to get it done and um, get everybody involved. 
So moving on to some like your memories of your time here in the house, what were some of the most memorable events that happened here? Well, memorable events or just situations. Or even a um, fond memory, just. Yeah, some of, uh, you know, work, getting the budget done on time. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, being under the wire, you know, before midnight on June 30th, being out there in, you know, a rally type atmosphere behind the governor, the Senate, the House, uh, being able to say to the public, we found a way to do this with your tax dollars. We're all here. We all did it. Um, th that's big, and, and that's, that's exciting. Uh, memorable moments, too, for a legislator is having an important piece of legislation actually being signed under the hand of governor. And I don't care who the governor is. Mm -hmm. I've had bills passed under every single governor that I've served with here. Um, each one of them just uh, monumental to those who worked on it with me. So when we do the signing, and then we invite or I invite the people that I think are the key stakeholders in it, most exciting, and actually most recently, was House Bill 400. I'm trying to think of what number that act is um, that I introduced um, that deals with a workplace experience for disabled high school students. Probably you, me, all of us had high school work experiences. You know, we got out into the workplace. You know, I worked at the Hershey drugstore. You know, um, as a kid. Um, and it got you out into an integrated workplace where you got paid what everybody else got paid. You were doing the same job everybody else did. And guess what? Those experiences all added together helped me get the next job whenever I got out of high school or college. Well, our disabled community generally doesn't have that. They don't have that opportunity. So while you and I and the general population uh, graduate to a job, very often they graduate to the couch and on public assistance and never having the opportunities. Uh, can I change the world with this? Absolutely not. But I worked with um, the disabled community and all of the service organizations that provide with and for them and the I Want to Work campaign, which was just outstanding, uh, in order to get this passed. So now through Again, I'm the chairman of labor as well. So through OVR, which is the Office of Vocational Rehabilitation, uh, in our labor and industry department, we now have in our school districts, and we're integrating it into all of them, an opportunity to assist in getting the kids that have been identified with you know, IEPs and the disability related to whatever they have dealing with in their life. They're just challenges. We all have challenges. Everybody's is different some and more than others, uh, but getting them out into the workplace, into an integrated workplace, getting the same salary and doing the same jobs uh, and actually having work experience when they graduate from high school and then into you know whatever is, is going to work best for them. Uh, that's one of the things I intend to stay involved in. I got the bill passed. It's signed into law. Uh, it, but as an advocate on the outside, possibly working with, and I've talked to some of those organizations, this is the only law of its type in the nation. So we probably will be looking to going to other states and seeing if we can make this happen in other places. So they're all exciting. I'm sorry. No, that's <laughs> they're wonderful. all exciting. Um, what aspect of being a representative did you enjoy the most and maybe what did you enjoy the least? I can't say that the, the only thing I can say uh, you don't enjoy a lot is uh, people being upset and disappointed. And then you can take that to being nasty or, you know, um, in their frustration or anger about things in government and them thinking that you have a magic wand <laughs> and you can fix it and change it. But uh, that's a challenge that I've never run away from. Part of what we do is education. Uh, I have a responsibility to explain to people my vote. You sent me here to vote for you, right? So I need to be able to tell you why I voted that way and uh, the reasons why we can or cannot do it, not just, hey, this is what I did, deal with it. So I, I don't run away from that. That's hard, you know, it's when it's not, you can't solve somebody's problem, solve all problems. Um, 
But I also didn't dislike that either. Um, my schedule is unbelievable, but that's uh, my doing. You know, it's I'm committed to doing my. I wear my staff out. Uh, they were teasing me over this most recent presidential election um, that they were going to run me for president. You know, they had worked with me and they knew my style and they were a little frustrated. And the one gal said, I'm just not going to do her calendar. I can't do her calendar. <laughs> Nobody wants to do my calendar. So, you know, the, the, the workload that, you know, we have and that I choose to do, that's... Um, challenging but it, to me that that's fine too so what did I like the best uh, the people my goodness um, I'm so honored to have had that privilege you know that I can talk to a person and know that I'm making their vote for them I'm making their vote because they can't do it you know they've put their faith and confidence in me seven different times and are just not happy that I'm retiring because they'd like to see me go till I'm 80, you know. Uh, but uh, there's great joy in that. So, and the excitement comes in accomplishing the legislation when it, when it comes to that, that's really exciting. So, I, I never really saw a negative part. Uh, one of the really good things is the, the, the technology that we can use because otherwise I'd be drowning in papers, legislation, and losing facts, and, but it's all now you know, pretty much at your disposal in your computer. So it's making it a little easier to clean out my office. <laughs> um, how do you want to be remembered, or your tenure to be remembered? Probably just um, serving the people to the level they want it and expect it, that I was no disappointment to anyone, except in the global government can't be everything to everybody. Uh, you know, I, that's all I've ever wanted is no matter what my job is, I want to do it to the best of my ability and do a job that affects other people. I just, uh, I don't know. There are certain jobs I probably couldn't do because I'd feel that it wasn't touching enough people but uh, no matter what job I've ever had, I've loved every job. There was only one that in my whole lifetime that I didn't love, uh, and I also didn't hate it, but it was when I was still in the medical field. Well, actually, my husband went back to school in Pittsburgh, and I went out, uh, ultimately worked for UPMC in the field. But when we first went out there, I worked for a private allergist, um, and uh, of course, then all he did was allergies. So. All of my work, all my hematology type work, running his lab, because he had his own little lab there, it was all the same stuff every day. Eosinophil after eosinophil, because that's what you see when you have allergies. I'm like, oh my goodness, no real, not enough connection with people. Although one of our patients was Mr. Rogers, who then I grew to love when I had children later, you know. Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, but he was exactly the same as a patient as he was on TV. <laughs> Little sweater. I thought he was going to sing to me. Won't you be my neighbor? Uh, but that was the only job. I thought, oh my goodness, I have to do something more than this. And that's when I went to UPMC, which was a, is a huge research. Met, met actually some of the earlier uh, heart transplants there that I did the blood work with and for. How exciting that was. So. I've never had a job that I didn't like, and it's always been the same. Is it something that's affecting, pos has the potential to affect positively? <laughs> it's your job to make it positive um, and keep you out with the people and not disappoint the people. And if I can, we can look back and say, wow, 17 bills, that's pretty good. I wonder what they were. Hmm, do I care? You know, did she take care of the people that sent her there? to vote on their behalf, and I do every single time I hit that button, I think of that. And 64,000 is a lot of people. <laughs> you know? It's hard to please them all. So if most of them think I did a good job for them, I've enjoyed working with them 14 years, shoulder to shoulder, uh, it's, been a, it's been a great ride. Well, that was my last question, but I would like to give you the opportunity for the last word if there's anything I, I well, missed. Well, yeah, I think you've heard it all, and <laughs> what, a, what a wonderful interview. Um, and uh, I do hope that people care enough to look into a bit of the history about uh, the people who have served, why they served, how they served, uh, how it went for them. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about my upcoming 
and continued work in leadership development and uh, recruitment, as I say, for other uh, young people and women in particular to bring the numbers to the ratio we really ought to have. How valuable um, this history in our archives is. Uh, what, what I would like to say is that I'm probably going to be using it a lot more than I have in the past. And I really appreciate the time uh, that you've taken to document um, for whoever's interested enough in knowing a little bit more about the job of a state legislator. Well, thank you so much for talking with me today. We really appreciate it. I'm delighted to be with you.